Joining us on the How Did You podcast today is Mike Kent, the co-founder of the Exerto, and I'm sure with any links to esports, you've seen him in your Twitter feeds. How are you doing, Mike? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, not bad. I don't think I'm in that many Twitter feeds. I think you just maybe follow the same subjects. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's open up with that. As I mentioned you t- to you briefly before this recording started, I created a new Twitter account to literally yeah. see how long it took me to get Dexerto in my Twitter impressions or anything like that. How do you yeah. feel that Dexerto is so interactable and out there that it doesn't take that long? It literally took me two hours. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of surreal, I guess, because it's like, you know, this this whole thing, I mean, Deserto itself started originally in, um, you know, we started it full time properly in 2015. And we had like some, we had an account that had, I think, like 30,000 followers um, from a previous iteration of Deserto, which is actually called Deserto with a C. But it was kind of like at the time it was a community forum for COD. Um, and we just basically took the basis of that and created a whole new company, created a whole new brand and changed really the way that we wanted to be. So, you know, in the past, it was kind of like focused um, mainly around esports, uh, sorry, around COD esports, um, like community. It was basically just a big forum. But um, so I've been kind of doing this since like 2008, um, like part time uh, or most of the time, to be honest, as a volunteer. Um, and then over the last, um, yeah, and then in 2015, I was working in a job in recruitment and a couple of the guys that I'd um, known from, um, you know, back in the original Deserto days, who were still my friends, um, they basically got a small amount of um, investment from an angel investor. I think it was only about £60,000 or something. Um, and we basically just had the idea, which in hindsight was obviously worked out. But I mean, most people would think it's crazy to start a media company based all around esports and at the time you know we wanted to be the quote-unquote ESPN of esports um which didn't exist at the time and um but quickly over the kind of the years we realized that wasn't really the the right uh, like angle and instead we kind of paved our own path um but yeah to answer your question it's it's kind of like really it's I guess it's surreal I guess to be you know in a in a company that has now like 130 people um you know gets has all the you know 13 million social followers has you know gets 30 odd million uniques at least a month um across our sites and you know in fact even just under so at the moment and it's yeah it's really surreal i mean yesterday i was sat in a meeting with one of my other co-founders and there was like 10 people in there and they were all sat there talking about campaigns and they were like tracking all this stuff and I just messaged him on the side and I was like, how surreal is this that like all these people work for us? Like it still doesn't really feel that normal. If that makes sense. It's kind of like, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's really hard to like, it's really hard to explain how we've kind of got to this point. I can completely understand that. And your LinkedIn mentions that before COVID 2019 time, you had a 3 million pound turnover. That also yeah. must be another surreal thing because since then, Dexerto with the COVID pandemic has only grown, grown, and grown yeah. because a lot of more people are getting into esports because, say, the CDL has expanded into franchises, or a lot of people are just seriously spending more time at home. Do you think that with the pandemic, it's kind of helped rather than hindered? Um, Well, I think that we were just in the, in the, we were in the right place at the right time, but I think we would have been bigger regardless. Um, And actually it really kind of slowed us down in a lot of areas um, because we weren't able to go on site at events. We weren't able to do more original programming. You know, we, before the pandemic, we were going out and kind of visiting people and, um, you know, doing like profiles on people. Like we did one on uh, Diego Ugamar. I can't even, actually, that's an absolute butchering of his name. So apologies. Um, you know, we did one on uh, Mango from C9. Um, a, a lot of it was esports focused, which was fine. And we still have a lot of esports focused content. But yeah, it kind of was, it was really surreal when it came to the pandemic because, you know, our company has essentially been set up anyway. It was predominantly online. Um, and actually, you know, we had an office in London, but um, the office itself was mainly filled with video production people and had some social people in there and had some kind of management and sales. And, you know, I live up in Edinburgh, so I'd go down there every two weeks and go down and, you know, we had all these plans. And when the pandemic hit, you know, the, the biggest worry for us was advertising spend because that's 
again, got massively hit. Um, it recovered quite quickly, but um, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, when, when the pandemic happened, you know, you thought the whole world was going to end. With, so I think in the long run, it's kind of worked for us because, you know, it's made us realize that online, you know, having people work remotely is still, you know, is, is key. And, you know, when we, when, when the pandemic hit as well, most of our staff were already working from home. So it didn't impact us like a lot of companies where they had people going into offices, you know, even the video production team, they went back and started working from home and, you know, post, well, not even post, pandemic, we're still in the pandemic, but, you know, even now we're kind of saying to them, do you want an office? Do you want to go back? And they're like, eh, actually we're, we're okay. And, you know, that we will, we, you know, we will have it. We're going to get reopen an office soon. Um, but it's actually, but it's actually not really needed in the way that we thought it was before. So that kind of helped us cut overheads, um, which as a startup is always important and really kind of made us refocus on what we needed to do. Um, and yeah, look, being at everyone being at home, that's definitely going to have had an impact on on stats and you know people consuming the content and people getting like you know warzone for example would it have been as big if there wasn't a pandemic i don't think so so and that's and that was a huge driver for us and um, for a long time because it really you know that game blew up and the i've got for example i have like a a group of friends from you know like not i don't really have any friends in the real world as they say that are also involved or were also involved in the esports and gaming space. But then when the pandemic hit, you know, I, I, instead of playing, instead of like meeting up with my friends, I'd be going and just playing Call of Duty and Warzone with them. And then they'd get into it. And now they're following the accounts and they're like sharing news with me about stuff that we've posted that I didn't even know yet. And, you know, it's like that. it's really helped kind of, I suppose, normalize gaming in many ways. So it has definitely helped, but I think, Deserto was just in the perfect position where we weren't relying on physical location and we weren't relying on people being in physical places to in order to make that. But it did impact us in a lot of ways as well. You know, it's only really now that we've been able to start going out and shooting content. I mean, when I went out and visited Hex in um, in, in August to, to shoot some content for Turtle Wax, uh, where we did basically a week-long documentary with Hector and followed him around for a week. When we did that, it actually... You know, I had to go to Mexico for two weeks. I mean, it sounds hard, but I had, to, I had to go to Mexico for two weeks in order to be able to get into the US. Like, that's just crazy. You know, before I was traveling to the US once a month and, you know, you didn't have to worry about anything. You'd have to test. You'd have to worry about getting COVID. You didn't have to worry about, you know, not being able to get home because you test testing positive. Like, it was just in and out and it was fine and there was more flights and it was cheaper. And, you know, so it's... It, it massively impacted us in that way. We had to really think, how do we make revenue? Obviously, we want to increase the amount of people on the site, but that isn't, you know, that isn't the whole business. That's that's part of our business, but a lot of it is working with commercial clients in order to 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 basically bring unique opportunities to them. And when you're just focusing purely online, it's really hard to just do that. You know, you've got a lot more options if you're working with a client. If you have, um. Yeah, you've got more options to work with a client if you have, um, you know, ability to shoot on site, you have ability to do in-person activations and, you know, we're, we're only really seeing that come back properly now. But yeah, it's, I think it was both good and bad. Um, it, it was obviously a really stressful time for everyone. So I, I felt very lucky that I didn't have to, um, you know, felt very lucky that I was still in the job. I felt very fortunate that we didn't have to like, cut any staff because of it we didn't have to you know there wasn't it basically i was really fortunate because i see i saw a lot of people impacted and um, you know especially people who work in physical industries you mentioned how you can now go and play with friends that you've got whether it be warzone or anything like that but dexerto also copies around um csgo news valorant news cod news yeah loads of different kind of esports but on a personal level what esports do you like to watch view read about or anything like that yeah so um to be honest like a lot of a lot of what we do with the is 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 there is esports but a lot of it is also like gaming so we have a bunch of gaming content um 
where we do reviews, we do guides, we do tips, we do tricks, we do what the biggest influences are saying. And another big part of it is the, you know, the entertainment side of things. So it's kind of influences and, and what they're saying and really encompassing all of gaming culture. But to answer your question, I'd say that probably the, 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 the one, the esports that I take the most notice in are Call of Duty because that is my background. You know, I started playing Call of Duty back in 2008 um, or earlier, whenever it was released, whenever COD 4 was released. In fact, I played COD 2 as well, that's a lie. So whenever COD 2 was released, 2003, 2004, something like that. Um, and then and then I've always been involved in that scene. So I've always kind of kept up to date with it. I don't necessarily watch it religiously, but, you know, when there's big matches on, big tournaments, I'll, I'll always try and watch you know we've just released a new podcast called reverse well it's the second season of our, of our reverse sweep podcast but this time around you know previously we had katie and pac-man who were you know great on the show but we instead this time we've just we've kept enable and we brought in sensor x and parasite three people who were like super outspoken like all four people who were super outspoken understand the game you know and i and i listened to that whole show you know, when I'm like driving around, like going to see my kids or um, going to the gym or whatever, or driving anywhere, I, I listen to the whole thing. And, you know, that's, that, that's kind of, for me, that's what I really like the, the personalities involved with that. That's always been the passion for me is the personalities behind it and trying to, I guess, trying to tell their stories. And um, so the COD, COD, COD esports is definitely one that I watch. And then CSGO, just because I find it, I've, you know, again, I've watched it for such a long time. I've played, you know, CS 1.6 back in the day, played CS Source, um, and then I've, and I've played a little bit of CSGO, not, not too much. But yeah, CSGO is another one I watch quite. I, I quite like the realistic shooter vibe. So for me, something like League of Legends isn't that appealing. Overwatch isn't that appealing. Even Valorant, I've kind of struggled with it because I don't really, I'm not playing it, so I don't really understand what the all the abilities quite do and you know it's it's like it just seems a little bit more random than say um something like csgo or cod well depending on the cod that is it's clear that dexerto is this ever-evolving brand and ever growing brand to the point where like you say the podcast reverse suite which is glorified in itself to be a successful podcast sorry has now attracted former world champions everybody like that yeah. but on a real level how does it feel that you can attract that and have such a gl glorified following of call of duty fans yeah i think it's like it's it's quite you know i guess for me it's kind of normal because i've, I've developed those relationships over time like you know i spoke to, first time i ever spoke to ax was back in manchester in 2012 you know the people like over the years I've kind of built those relationships so it does kind of come a little bit normal and you know a lot of people kind of look at these people and, and, and get almost like you know whenever they speak to them they're not like themselves they're like just ask them all the questions that everyone always asks for me it's always been kind of like I always treat anyone whether it's you know yourself or you know someone who's up and coming and like you know has I'm sure a great future in this industry to someone like Hector or another kind of or nature or a John Robertson or whoever the other end of the pole where it's kind of like they're their absolute successful end I speak to those I speak to everyone exactly the same so I try you know I think that's and that's the best way I've, I've learned anyway to develop relationships with people is is not to treat them differently like you know for example before the show you tried to call me sir and I was like why would like that <laughs> why would you call me sir like I'm just another person. And as soon as someone says like, sir, to me, that's kind of telling me that they're like, they don't think they're on my level. And I think that I take that philosophy. in when I speak to people who in theory have more of a um, head, like or more popular or whatever. We don't know what's going to happen next with this pandemic, but yeah, there'll always be a future for Dexerto. Cause like you say, it's online and it, yes, it took a hit, but Dexerto with the people behind it will always grow and adapt. So yeah. what is next for Dexerto? Yeah, well, like you say, it's it's really we, we don't know because we we are just incredibly good at adapting and adapting quickly, getting ahead of trends. Um, one thing that we kind of jumped on recently, for example, is we started covering um 
influencers a lot more, both in, like in, especially in video format, which is kind of something that I've been driving. So for example, you've got, um, you know, we launched Influenced, which is um, a sh- essentially short form channel on YouTube. Um, and in the space of the last six, seven months, we've just passed 500 million views. Um, we, on the back of that success, we got a exclusive partnership with Snapchat where we asked, you know, where we do now longer versions of that. We're also, you know, grown quite big on TikTok. Um, and we're also kind of just expanding out and seeing what, again, what we can do in, in all those different areas. And we know that, for example, the new generation of people, the Gen Z, as they call them, they, they want short form, quick content. So, you know, stuff like this podcast, for example, you know, it, it's, it's almost, it is, it's, there's always going to be a demand for longer form content. And we want to provide that as well. For example, with reverse sweep, the latest episode was an hour and 45, but we also want to be able to provide short cut down snippets of that as well. And really the influencer space is, is so interesting and really untapped. So a lot of what we're going to be doing is moving into the, um, like original programming. So, you know, at the moment we just launched to so originals, you know, the, the initial lineup that we have is like, we've launched Cypher PK, we've launched Hastro, we've got Hitch from Optic Next. Uh, we've got a complexity office tour with Jason Lake. We'll talk about like what's happened there. Um, you know, bringing on people like Tim the Tatman, all that jazz. You know, and we also did a shoot with um, Kay from formerly of Fizz, who was obviously kicked out because um, he, he was accused of, uh, scamming people with a crypto coin um, and you know so it's like and, and we've got a whole bunch of people lined up to do that as well and really that's where we that's where I see my kind of area to expand is is into these new worlds you know like how do we work in the st- how do we work in streaming how do we work it, you know how do we bring streaming to, out of the how do we um, you know how do we make influencers part of just like that's that's all the future for us on that end but then on the other side you've got a lot of and, and that's because i focus a lot on the creative side of things whereas if you look at something like you know a, a lot of people in the team for example they're working with um you know like ads and working on the website tech and you know there's just so much underneath the circle that i guess people don't really see they you know there's always that thing where people it's less so now because you know i think we've kind of earned our stripes but you know back in the day there might have been a few salacious headlines you know that <laughs> but at the time that was just what was required and we didn't know any better but over the years we've grown to understand that you know what needs to be a certain standard what needs to what a title needs to be what a thumbnail needs to be and that's kind of like how we've always progressed but yeah we don't know what's next could be the nft crypto space um, you know, we could even get into more traditional forms of media, who knows, sports, anything like fighting, like it just, we, we don't know really. And it's, I guess that's what's the exciting thing is that, and that's really what I enjoy about my job is that I'm able to kind of push into these new areas and see what we can do and really grow the brand there. And what a lot of what I've done at DeSoto is I'll go into a new area and I'll, you know, almost set the foundation for that. And then we bring in more people who then hopefully know more a lot more than i do and then they're able to take that off so you know for example with um you know influenced or to certain originals i don't want to be the person that's on the camera eventually you know i'm sure i'll do them every now and then but and you know i I don't want to be the one that's coming up with ideas for what's happening i want you know and that's what's happened with like the editorial side of things i kind of got to a certain point where i was writing like up to sometimes 14 articles a day and then, you know, grew the team out. But it got to a point where my skills are no longer working there. So we, then we brought people in who knew what the, to do, to how to expand it out. And uh, I guess that's that's what my, specifically, that's what my role will be. But yeah, it's just everything is just going to be bigger and hopefully better. I definitely think it will be because, like you say, Desert is this ever-evolving product which never really stops. And you're able to obviously pull the trigger on whatever you want to because of how long you spent in the industry and how much of an understanding you've got of certain subjects. But yeah. that, that understanding must have came from somewhere or someone at least. Who do you personally like look up to? Because there must be a lot of people within esports or just within your day-to-day life like, Hex used to be involved or may still be involved with uh, Dexerto and he pulled the trigger and took a chance on you who else have you looked up to for to get like say Dexerto off its feet or just as a personal who do you look up to I actually don't look up to anyone um 
and that's not because I think that I'm better than everyone else, but um, I think that like, I think you can look at different people's stories and see what they've done. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of people in the business world that have kind of like gone from, you know, small scale to, to up. But I honestly, I've, I don't really, I don't really think of it like that. I don't, I've never looked up to anyone specifically. I've never had like an idol in a certain area or, and I think that's just me as a person. I appreciate that other people are going to do that. And if that's, again, really not me thinking that I'm better than everyone else. But I think it goes back to a lot of what I said before, where I feel like I'm on the same level. Um, I think like a lot of my motivation comes from, um, is, well, a lot, I, I, I do get a lot of motivation from my co-founders, like, and, and seeing how hard they work and seeing how, you know, see on all the different ideas that they put in. And, you know, I'm often, I often feel I get that imposter syndrome where I feel like, I'm not, I'm not on the same level as those guys. And, you know, they, they try to reassure me that I am, but it's still that kind of like that self doubt that I think everyone has. And, you know, it's really, it's really difficult sometimes to get motivation to do things because, you know, as, as we were talking before, like personal things come up, things change, you know, like, I'm getting older. How does that affect my men- mentality? Like, you know, so I'm not really, yeah, I'm not, um, I don't look up to anyone particularly, but I do find sources of inspiration from different areas. Um, you know, you look at anyone, I, I, whether it's someone who's started a business and even if it's just a one man band and they've now kind of grown it to a stage where they're like, you know, comfortably living off that. That's motivation for me as much as looking at a billionaire who's like Jeff Bezos, who's gone from, you know, started this company and then is now a billionaire or the richest man, one of the richest men in the world. So for me, it's, yeah, I I take inspiration off a lot of different, in a lot of different areas, but there's no one particularly that I look up to. And to answer your question about Hex, you know, he's, I consider him as a friend. I couldn't consider him as an idol or, and I don't, I equally, I appreciate it. He didn't mean to say it, but he didn't really give me the opportunity. You know what I mean? It's just, we, we just joined together and, um, you know, he, he definitely helped in a lot of ways and his support has been great. And having someone like that support you is, is always going to be appreciated. Um, but yeah, he, you know, and, and he is no longer, um, you know, he, he basically when, when we first started to so, serve, he had a, an account uh, called Optic Intel and we basically traded the account for some shares in the company. But I think it was like last, I think it was in 2019 or 2020. I can't remember when um, we basically bought those shares back from him um, because, you know, people always like thought that he owned us and when actually he was just a minority shareholder and he didn't actually have, you know, any input other than just if we asked him for advice on something and it, it was never, you know, people kind of conf- confuse that with us being like, oh, we then must write about good things about optical all the time, which, you know, if you look at our articles, just isn't true. I can completely understand that. I think where that alluded from is the fact that you just scroll down to the bottom, it'd be a disclaimer and things like that. Yeah, that was a lot. That was a lot. Yeah. No, and, you know, if, but that's just journalistic integrity, isn't it? If you, if you're writing about someone who also works for you, you kind of need to just to, to declare that. And, you know, probably sometimes we've, it was missed, but again, it wasn't intentionally missed. It was just, you know, it was just a process that has since been improved. But yeah, we don't have to worry about that anymore because he's, you know, we bought him out. We see Dexerto left, right and centre as consumers of your content. But there must be a kind of pressure that there is from other media outlets from within, say, esports. But no matter what, Dexter will always be there for people to look up to and for people to take inspiration from. How does it feel that your content it's alone is kind of being the content that people are looking up to or trying, not in a way trying to copy, but trying yeah. to replicate in a professional manner? I mean, sometimes they do just straight copy and that's fine. You know, that's the, that's the game. And I guess there's nothing you can do about that. And look, credit to anyone that wants to try and start uh, a media company because it's incredibly difficult and I look back and I, I get almost get anxious and think about where we were 
And like that, you know, I don't look back with like rose tinted glasses and be like, oh, that was, it was such an amazing time when we do this. No, it was, it was absolutely torture. And, you know, it, it can still be torture. That's just the reality of running a business. And um, I definitely feel for some of my co-founders, like I said about, you know, that I, I don't necessarily feel that I'm on their level from a business perspective. Creatively, that's a bit different. But yeah, when it comes to like, you know, like people looking up to us and people like copying our ideas and whatever, <laughs> I think that's fine. I mean, look, we, we've we've taken inspiration from loads of companies on our way up. You know, we saw the mainstream media outlets doing certain things. So we wanted to do that, you know, obviously try and put your own spin on it all the time. Um, but there's sometimes where, you know, it's if someone's doing something good, then why wouldn't you then try and do your own version of that? It's just that's just how the world works. That's why when a, you know, a pizza, sh- that's why you always get like certain types of shops all in the same vicinity of each other because they're all competing against each other. They're all selling and doing the same thing. You know, Papa John's Domino's and um, Pizza Hut, they're all doing the same thing. And they're all in the a very similar, like you know, where I live, it's literally like you can see what you can see each of them from the same location, you know, so, and, but they, and they, and they're constantly fighting to try and be unique in that area. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't think there's anyone at the moment that's like a real, I suppose, there's, def- there's definitely companies that obviously, that, and always will be companies that are bigger than us in this space when it comes to media. Um, you know, we're still, we're still brand new, essentially, compared to like, you know, an iGen or a GameSpot, but also we're also attracting an audience that they're not. And then equally, you know, when you have endemic, um, when you have like esports endemic competitors, you know, that they're, they're also kind of just, they're not doing everything that we're doing from like the entertainment and influencer point of view and the gaming and esports. Like, you know, so yeah, it's kind of like, it's interesting that, that people would think to look up to it because I, I would never think that. But, um, but yeah, it's good that, I guess, a good, that, good that's the case. But I, I'm equally of the opinion that like, you know, the, the old phrase, um, was it high tides raise all ships? So it's like, you know, the, the bigger that everyone can get, the better, I guess. Um, obviously, you're always going to have, like, internal competition to want to beat the other people or the other companies. Um, but equally, I'm like, you know, when it's someone like, for example, Zuma, who's like, a, you know, is, is does his own podcast, basically. You know, that, the the flank, that that's actually, I love seeing him succeed. Like, I love seeing all these other companies succeed. And you know, one thing I've really tried to instill in myself and also try to kind of make sure that, that it's a philosophy they have is not, not everyone's not the enemy, you know, like you can, you can trade back and forth ideas and advice and, you know, that with other companies that might be sharing a similar space to you, because if you just make yourself a small Island, then, you know, you just waste so much time with hostility and actually you can be getting advice. You know, we get advice from, I get advice from people on a daily basis about, things that we need to do in the circle from other companies. Um, and I think, you know, that the sharing is caring thing, as long as it's not like, you know, I guess with something like Pizza Hut, Domino's, whatever, they actually might be actively taking each other's profits. But I just, because the internet, because it's the internet, I just think it's like, I just don't see it like that, basically. Like you say, if you bring a group of people together, that helps because then that could lead to further impressions or anything like that. Yeah. But you've also got the impressions that one whole kind of esports community as a whole would also benefit because it's just an ever growing process which will eventually work out for everybody in the in the past in the future. Sorry, but if you had to give somebody a bit of advice for the future, whether it be life advice, professional advice, or just any kind of advice at all, what would you give them? Why? From a personal point of view. I find it, I think like whenever I've kind of hired people, for example, I always look for the person rather than their experience. So a lot of people that, you know, and that's not always, you have, to, there has to be some cases where it absolutely needs to be the case. But, um, you know, like you bring a product manager, it needs to have experience of being a product manager, but it's equally mostly about the personality. So I think that, you know, what people can do is just be, just well you've got to be yourself because otherwise it's just tiring trying to be something else but just just i actually don't know i actually don't know what advice i'd give anyone (laughs) um 
I mean, look, the whole work hard thing, I think, is is fine. But one big bit of advice I'd give to someone um, is don't treat, like, a job, unless it's, like, a dead-end job. But if it's you've got an opportunity in a, in a company, don't, like, don't be worrying about what time you start and finish and stuff like that. Don't feel like it's, like, you're giving your time so you're getting something back. Like, that is obviously the case, and that's why anyone does a job. That's why I do a job. But equally, you can't be like sit counting the hours and, you know, worrying about the fact that you've worked half an hour more one day, you know, and, and almost resenting the fact for that. If, you, if that's the case, you're probably in the wrong job or you're not progressing enough. Um, but actually, my the, I've, I've remembered my my famous advice is shy. It's a it's a phrase shy bands getting out. So if you don't ask, you don't get. So if you're if you're working for someone, you know, and I, I have this conversation all the time with my staff, it's like if you don't tell me that you need help or if you don't tell me you need something, then I can't, I'm not just going to know, you know, I'm not going to suddenly guess that, or sometimes it happens, but I'm probably not going to guess that you need that. And it's, you know, like if you need help doing something then you need to ask someone instead of doing, instead of doing the job badly and then it getting fixed and then someone doing it for you anyway, why not just ask in the first place? Why not? If you want to progress to a company, why aren't you asking about where your progression is in the company? Why are you, why are you waiting for someone to, 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 to pluck you out you know you've got to make your intentions known if you want something you've got to ask for it and I'm I'll, I have that philosophy in all of my life if I want something I'll ask for it or I'll try get it you know I don't wait around you know like I don't wait until someone tries to give me an opportunity to do something I'm you know like I'm on a weekly basis I'm going out to all these different creators and organizations and I'm constantly trying to set up calls and talk to them no one does that with me you know, no one's coming to me and being like, oh, I really want to speak to you, Mike. You know, so you have to go out and get that. Otherwise, I would never be where I was if I just never asked. You know, when I started doing interviews for um, when we were do- at events, there never used to be a press area. There never used to be anything. I used to just have to go up to the, the players and say, can we do an interview and explain why it was benefit to them? But and that's that's all back to that philosophy. If you don't ask, you don't get. People don't ask me what for stuff that they want. I'm, I'm, you're just risking me guessing that you want that.